Amen. The message today has the title, The Executioner. And I know that for many of you all, an image comes to mind. And to a certain extent, it's logical that that image should come to mind because that's the way in which we normally encounter that word. And there is an element of God that does conform to that image. But where we're going today, you shall see very soon. But first, consider the illustrative value of the sinking of the SS Dorchester in the North Atlantic, the cold night of February 3rd, 1943, with the loss of 678 lives out of 904 men aboard. Mark Poley was a young chaplain assigned to this ship. Before leaving, he asked his father, Daniel Poling, to pray not for his safety, but that he would be adequate for any situation. When the enemy torpedo struck and the ship started down, many of the men froze in fear. Young Poling, with three other chaplains, strapped their own life belts to the fear-stricken men, helped load the life belt, boats rather, and joined hands in a circle of prayer as they went to their watery graves. His father's prayer had been answered. He found adequacy where he had not found safety. Bow your heads with me, please. Blessed Lord, you have caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn and take them to heart. That by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This message begins with our gospel text, but my thought for today actually comes from the first reading, the prophecy of Jeremiah. But let me begin Luke 19, verse 29. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. For those words to marinate in your minds for a little bit. I don't know how many of you all are familiar with horses. I was blessed, I guess, to have a rocking horse when I was a little boy, a little black and white thing that had a string that you could pull and it would neigh and whinny. And my uncle Dwight had an Arabian at that horse stable that was on 35th Avenue off of Grant Street, the one that burned down. His horse was one of the casualties of that fire. But I never had the opportunity to participate in the breaking of a horse. I've seen a few movies. Now you all have probably seen some of them too, like Flicka or Spirit, you know, and it has that scene where that young horse who's never had a body on him before has his first experience of someone climbing on his back. Some say that breaking a horse is a lot like raising a child and that just as no horse ever naturally came into the world prepared for somebody to climb on their back and ride them around. No child is ever coming into the world thoroughly equipped to be an obedient son or daughter. In fact, just like those, those colts, more often than not, they buck and stir and turn and flop while they get used to the notion that no, I am not all that there is in the world. But Nevertheless, this was the cult 
This was the animal that our Lord sent two disciples to go get. And he then told them to untie that colt, the one on which no one had ever sat, and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. Now, in Luke's version, it only he only talks about the colt, but Matthew mentions that there is also the colt's mother. And so there were two horses. But Luke focuses on the colt, the one who had never been ridden. But that's the one the Lord asked for. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? After all, there is this adult donkey right here that's accustomed to being used. But anyway, why are you taking our coat? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Well, welcome to Advent, saints. During Advent, we reflect on the coming of the Lord. Both his first coming and his second coming are key events in the Missio Dei, the mission of God. But if we only focus on the physical aspects of it, the physical impact of Christ's coming, we might miss the real reason that God, the Son, took flesh and dwelt among us. As we approach Christmas, we focus on the image of sweet little Jesus baby. When we enter Passion Week, the video images from the machinations of the Sanhedrin, the leading up to the unjust sentencing of Pilate to our Lord's bitter sufferings and death fill us with horror and sorrow and longings for justice. I know when I was a child and I'd read those stories and Arthur Mitchell's Bible stories and I'd get to that volume where it talked about the crucifixion, I used to always wish that somebody would come, a rescuer, I don't know, maybe Superman, the Lone Ranger, Batman, somebody would come and save that innocent man. Because by nature, our preference is that the guilty are punished and the innocent go free. Some of you may have had those feelings over the past couple of weeks. We divorced that story from the prophetic declaration we heard today in our first reading. God's purpose was to establish righteousness in the only way that would be complete and unimpeachable by connecting our righteousness to his person. When Jesus rode on that colt, that colt fulfilled the purpose for which it was born. It might not have known it, it probably didn't understand it, but nevertheless, that colt, that colt uniquely among all the colts, all the donkeys, whoever had been born, was born for this moment. It hadn't been prepped by humans, hadn't been guided and shaped. In fact, it reminds me of us. Yes, saints. Before that moment when our Lord united us to himself in the waters of holy baptism, he didn't really know what it meant to love as we are loved, to love our neighbors ourselves. We didn't really know how to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We didn't really know how to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. Oh yes, we went to Sunday school. We learned some songs, you know, Jesus loves the little children. Y'all probably learned that one and others. It's one of the reasons why I'm always curious as to why our brothers and sisters who don't believe baptism saves and don't believe that the baptism of babies does anything, why do they bother? Because the Bible clearly says that the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. They're spiritually discerned. And until you've been united to Christ in his death by baptism, you don't understand the things of God. You understand the law because the law is written on you. You're designed for the law, but you're not designed for faith. You're not born to have faith. You've got to be born again. 
And when Christ returns, gather the church together and redeem the down payment gift of the Holy Spirit who was given to us when the Lord united us to himself through the waters of baptism, then we'll fulfill the purpose for which we were born. That complete union of God and man when we know, even as we now are known, everything that we believe, teach, and confess concerning the gospel is rooted in the exceeding great and precious promises that God has declared in his word which is filled with exhibit after exhibit of evidence concerning the righteousness of our God and our inability to conform ourselves to that righteousness unless and until we are united by faith in Christ Jesus and experience and trust in those exceeding great and precious promises that he's declared in his word. Allow me to get to the text that I really had in mind. Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 16. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. To show how incapable man was of conforming to the righteousness of God, he picked one nation from among the children of Abraham, from among the sons of Adam, the children of Israel as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 10 through 12. So I led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and made known to them my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath as a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And Isaiah 41, 8 and 9. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. You, whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from his farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. That's what he said to Israel, to that people alone of all the nations on the earth. Oh, yes, other nations had stories about their origins, about how special they were, about how God took them and did this and that. But those are the stories that they made up. Israel didn't make up this story. It was given to them. God wrote that story, handed it to them. They couldn't look at it and say one mumbling word about it. Then on top of that, it wasn't a very rosy story anyway. Because even with all those advantages, Israel failed to execute the stewardship that she had been given. And yet, God declares here, I have chosen you and not cast you off. In spite of Israel's failure. He didn't cast her away. He didn't throw Israel out. You know, the way sometimes people do to you when you disappoint them, when you let them down. No. Instead, he reached deeper. He reached down to the level of one tribe, the level of, of, of one group, the level of one family, to choose to use one Trusting that one with the purpose that even this nation, with all its advantages, was unable to fulfill. As it is written, Luke chapter 2, verses 30 through 32. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. 
Yes, saints. God the Father gave to his only begotten son the mission of establishing his righteousness in the earth. And when he had done so, through the, his own precious blood that he freely shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins, Christ died for you. And some of you who are Bible scholars will say, but wait a minute, don't you say that Jesus was sinless and that the wages of sin is death? And you're right. Death had no right to Jesus. Jesus didn't deserve to die. In fact, in order for Jesus to die, he had to change the order of things. You do know that there were times that his enemies wanted to kill him. Or there was a time they wanted to throw him off the edge of the cliff. There was a time they wanted to stone him. Oh, they wanted to kill him. And every time they try, he just walked right through the midst of them. Even on the night when they wanted to arrest him, and he identified himself, I am he. He had to allow them to get back up again, allow them to take him, allow them to accuse him. He could have refuted all of their lies with a single word, but he kept silent. He had to allow the whipping to happen, the, the nail to pierce his flesh. He decided that it was time to die. So much so that when word got back, Pilate said, are you sure? He had to do that because otherwise it couldn't happen. And so when he had done so, God the Father, by the Spirit, raised him from the dead, accepting his blood as the payment for our sins. For his sake, God established the church to be his witness committing to us the ministry of reconciliation, giving to us the treasure of the gospel, saying to us, freely you have received, freely give, so that the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness might be satisfied. Well, I know sometimes I don't feel like there's anybody out there that hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Sometimes, and according to some people, this town is just filled with people who take pleasure in wickedness, who delight in iniquity, who rejoice in chaos. But you all know that there are some folk here, some folk that don't take pleasure in wickedness, some people that don't try to, to create chaos, and even in those that do, nevertheless, as Christ has passion for us, we should have passion for the world for whom Christ died. We should be passionate about the message that births faith in those who hear it. And guess what, beloved? Sometimes that message births faith in people who were previously trained, well brought up, given every encouragement, prepared, if you will, to receive the gospel. It brings forth faith in them. And it also brings forth faith in some others weren't so equipped, weren't so fortunate, who in fact had the very opposite happen. Sometimes folk get so twisted, so broken by life and circumstances that all they know is chaos. And because all they know is chaos, all they want to bring is chaos. As the old saying goes, hurt people hurt people. And yet the same message, the same gospel works for them just like it works for the other. As Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. If there were no other reason than this, that's enough of a reason to gather together if you're physically able to do so. Believe me, I love those who watch the videos on our Facebook page. I, I, I am so glad that we're able to bless them with that. 
But there's something about being able to look at a person and give them, give him or her a blessing to, you know, pass the peace to one another, to shake one another's hands and say, peace be with you. Or even in an era of masks and shots and things, to risk a hug. To join them at the altar for Holy Communion and to hear the songs of the church being sung. Can't really hear all that and experience all that on a Facebook live stream or on a recorded video. But there's something else. You can't experience how God is working in you to will and to do for your good pleasure from a monitor or a tablet screen. It was when they saw Jesus riding that colt that they recognized his royal authority and gave God the praise that he deserves as it's written in our gospel text. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt and they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We cannot expect the world that is without Christ to understand what the church only understands by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the only way that can change is by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the means that God has granted in order to establish righteousness in the earth. The life transforming power of the Spirit is available to those who have been born of God through the gospel. And God has promised to do so through the means of grace but he's made no promise to anyone through any other way. First Thessalonians chapter three, Paul writes, now may our God and father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. That's straight from the word of God, saying God will establish your heart blameless in the faith. Or you can continue to attempt to establish it yourself. But that, generally speaking, ends in conflict, confusion, and failure. Yes, that colt never before had a body on its back. But when the Lord Jesus sat on it, it found itself able to do what no man thought possible. In like manner, when the Lord came into our lives as he united us to himself, we found ourselves doing things that no one would have thought possible. We found all of a sudden the ability to love our neighbor as ourselves we found the ability to trust in the Lord and do good, to dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. We found in ourselves the ability to love the Lord our God with our heart. Because he put it there. He steered us. He directed our steps. He brings us together for worship and to receive his gift. He does that in ways that still amaze me. So let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord.